Hi, my name is Daryl Peterson and I'm the manager of the Applications Engineering Department here at MicroMeasurements. I'd like to take a minute and show you how a strain gauge works. And we're going to use the equation for the resistance of a conductor. So if we look at this equation, it says resistance is equal to rho, which is the resistivity of an alloy, multiplied by the length of the alloy divided by its cross-sectional area. So if we look at a strain gauge, essentially it is a uh, continuous conductor that serpentines back and forth and as you glue that strain gauge onto a structure and you put it under a, a positive, let's assume a tensile strain, the length of these lines get a little bit longer. And as they get a little bit longer, they also reduce ever so slightly in their cross-sectional area and we assume the res resistivity is a constant what that means is that we get a slight resistance increase. And if we were to take that structure and put it under a compressive load, the length of these small lines would get a little bit shorter. The cross-sectional area would actually go up ever so slightly, and that would cause the total resistance to go down. So we can basically surmise how a strain gauge works using the analogy of a piece of wire or the resistance of a conductor. You can almost think of it like a piece of wire. As you stretch it, it gets longer. As you compress it, it gets a little shorter, and that's what creates the resistance change. Oftentimes, we have customers that look at a strain gauge and they think, well, it's just a variable resistor. Why don't I take a, an ohmmeter and measure the strain gauge response directly? And it's a very common thought that we see. One of the big issues, though, is that the amount of resistance change you get from the strain gauge is actually quite small. So it can be very difficult to resolve a very, very small resistance measurement within a relatively large starting resistance, such in this case, which is 120 ohms. Now the next slide, I'm going to introduce the gauge factor equation to help uh, illustrate this issue. The gauge factor equation is given as K is equal to the relative resistance change, or delta R over R, divided by delta L over L, which is our strain. So the gauge factor is, is essentially a sensitivity measurement of the strain gauge that allows us to correlate the strain and this factor that we give you to the amount of resistance change that you get from the gauge. Now if we take this equation and we rearrange it, we find that we're left with the change in resistance is equal to the starting resistance times the gauge factor times the strain level. And if I plug in some values, making some assumptions, the value for the gauge factor I'm going to assume is 2, which is pretty typical for constant tan and karma alloy strain gauges. And we've already said that this strain gauge starts at 120 ohms. And I'm going to assume a strain level of 0 0.001 strain. And that's equivalent to 1,000 microstrain. If this were on aluminum, it'd be roughly about 10,000 PSI. If it were on steel, it'd be roughly about 30,000 PSI. So it's a reasonable level of strain or load that you're putting through the structure. So if I take those values and I plug them into that equation, what I'm left with is that for a thousand microstrain of change, I get a change in resistance equal to 0.24 ohms. So keep that in mind. The gauge starts at 120, and it doesn't go up to 125 or 130 or 140. It goes from 120 to 120.24, given a substantial level of load or stress in that part. So what does that mean to us? Well, if we want to be able to resolve one microstrain, if we were going to take an ohmmeter and measure the gauge directly, we'd have to be able to resolve 120.00024 ohms. And that's a pretty tough measurement. That means you've got to have eight digits plus a decimal on your multimeter. That's the reason why the vast majority, and I would say 99% of strain gauge measurements are done with a Wheatstone bridge. The Wheatstone bridge does really two things for us. First, it converts the resistance change to an electrical response. Secondly, it effectively nulls out the initial starting resistance. If everything is balanced in a Wheatstone bridge, meaning all the resistance values are the same, then you get no electrical output signal. And that's really a video for later. If you'd like to find out more about how a strain gauge works, take a look at our website at www.micro-measurements.com. Thank you.